very important study. The title is The Gathering. But before we begin, we want to have a word of prayer to ask for the Lord's blessing. Father in heaven, we thank you for your wonderful Sabbath day. And we ask that as we open your holy word, that your spirit will be with us to open our minds and hearts, to empower us to share this wonderful message that you have given to your remnant church. I ask, Lord, that your word will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that for which you sent it. We pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. As we examine the red letter edition of the Bible, the red letter edition, by the way, is where the words of Jesus are in red lettering, we discover something very interesting. And that is, when you go to the book of Revelation, you'll find that Jesus has much to say personally to the seven churches, beginning in Revelation 1, verse 1, through verse 21 of chapter 3. However, after Revelation 3, 21, you find nothing in red letters until Revelation 22, verse 7, where Jesus speaks again. But there is one exception between these two points, between Revelation 3.21 and Revelation 22 and verse 7. And that is Revelation 16 and verse 15. That verse is in red letters, which means that Jesus speaks in the first three chapters, concluding in verse 21 of chapter 3, picks up again in Revelation 22 and verse 7, the only time in between where the words of Jesus are in red letters is in Revelation 16 and verse 15. This must mean that this verse that is inserted there must be extremely important. So let's read that verse, Revelation 16, verse 15. Here Jesus speaks and he says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Three words that I want to underline. Garments, naked, and shame. Now, Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, uses similar terminology to Revelation 3, verse 18, which is a portion of the message of Jesus to the church of Laodicea. So let's notice Revelation 3 and verse 18, where you find these three common concepts. That is garments, shame, and nakedness. It says there in Revelation 3 verse 18, Jesus once again is speaking, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich. And white garments, there's one key term, and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame, there's a second key word, of your nakedness, the third key word, may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Clearly, there's a connection between Revelation 16, 15, and Revelation 3, and verse 18. This means that the message to the church of Laodicea, which is specifically to Adventists, is in focus also in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. That is, Revelation 16, verse 15, has a special message for Seventh-day Adventists, as does the message to the church of Laodicea. Let's notice an interesting statement from Ellen White where she applies the message to Laodicea to the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is in Selected Messages, volume 2, page 66. It says this, the message to the Laodiceans is applicable to Seventh-day Adventists who have had great light and have not walked in the light. It is those who have made great profession but have not kept in step with their leader that will be spewed out of his mouth unless they repent. So, Revelation 3.18, message to the church of Laodicea. We believe the Seventh-day Adventist church is the church of Laodicea. 
used as the three terms, garments, shame, and nakedness, as does Revelation 16, verse 15. That means that Revelation 6, uh, 16 and verse uh, 15 has a special message for the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, you'll notice that in the message to Laodicea, it warns that if we don't accept the remedies that Jesus suggested or recommended, that He will spew us out of His mouth. Another way of saying that is that we will be shaken out of the church. Notice what Ellen White had to say in volume one of the testimonies, page 181, where she describes shaking out as being uh, synonymous with being spewed out of the mouth. It says there, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this will cause a shaking among God's people. So notice that this message is so important, the message to the church of Laodicea is so vital, that those who do not accept it will be spewed out of the mouth of Jesus. Another way of saying it is they will be shaken out. In Revelation 16 verse 15, that uses the same terminology, indicates that this message is especially guided for Seventh-day Adventists. Now, we need to consider Revelation 16, verse 15 in context. This verse is found in the context of the sixth plague of the book of Revelation. I want to read the entire passage that describes the sixth plague, and then we're going to dedicate the rest of our time to um, unraveling uh, the, the specific chronology of this passage because there are some issues related to the passage. Revelation 16 verse 12 contains the message uh, concerning the sixth plague. It says like this, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So notice, the sixth angel pours out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. As a result, the water is dried up, and this prepares the way for the coming of the kings from the east. And then in verse 13 it says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, also known as Armageddon. Then comes verse 15. Behold, Jesus is speaking, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches, and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And then verse 16, And they, that is the three evil spirits, gathered them, that is the kings of the earth and the whole world, together to the place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. Now, we have some issues related to the chronology of what we find in the message concerning the sixth plague. Let me just give you the chronological sequence of events. If not, we're, we're not going to be able to make sense out of this passage because the passage is not in chronological order. So let's notice, first of all, verse 12. It describes the sixth plague. Verse 12 describes the sixth plague. It says, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way for the kings of the east might be prepared. So, verse 12 describes the sixth plague. 
But now we're going to notice that uh, the scene goes backwards to pre-probationary time. In other words, before the close of probation. Uh, to the gathering of the wicked for the sixth plague. It says there in verses uh, 13 and 14, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So in verse 12, you have the outpouring of the sixth plague. Then verses 13 and 14 take you back to probationary time to describe the gathering of the wicked by three evil angels prepared for the battle of Armageddon, for the final battle. And then in verse 15, we have a warning for God's people. Jesus says to his people, make sure that in that gathering, you are on the Lord's side when the sixth plague is poured out. And that's where verse 15 comes in, where Jesus says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And then verse 16 once again takes us back to the moment when all of the wicked world is gathered and probation closes. God's people are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and the wicked are totally on Satan's side. Now we'll come back to this sequence in a little while, but what I want, to, want us to notice now is what occurs when probation closes. The Bible teaches that when probation closes, every person will have irre irrevocably chosen sides. All will be gathered on one side or on the other. As in the days of Noah, the closing of the door shut out the wicked and secured the righteous, so will it be when probation closes for the world. When Jesus pronounces the awesome words of Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11, which I'm going to read now, every case has been decided for life or death. This is how it reads. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Clearly, at this point, the destiny of every human being has already been decided for eternity. The wicked are irrevocably gathered to Satan's side, and the righteous are irrevo irrevocably gathered on God's side. The wicked have received at this point the mark of the beast, and God's people have received the seal of God. And Satan now will have total and entire control over those who are on his side. After probation's close, it's not necessary for Satan to deceive the wicked, because the wicked are already deceived. The wicked are already irrevocably deceived by Satan. They are on the devil's side. But there's one group that has not come to the devil's side, and that is what Matthew 24 calls the elect. A group that has not followed the deceptions of Satan. So now, after probation closes, Satan's focus will be on those who have not uh, given in to his deceptions. But now we have an issue. The issue is this. All Seventh-day Adventists that I know of believe that the plagues will be poured out after the close of probation. So here's the question. If the plagues are poured out after the close of probation, including the sixth plague, why is it that this passage in Revelation 16 speaks of the gathering of the wicked for the final battle before the sixth plague is poured out. In other words, 
is the gathering of the wicked taking place during the sixth plague? Or is it perhaps true that the gathering took place during probationary time? Well, we're going to find that verses 12 through 16 are not in strict chronological order. Verse 12 describes the outpouring of the sixth plague, and we'll come back to this in detail. Then verses 13 through 15 describe the gathering of the wicked and the warning for the righteous not to gather on the side of the wicked. And then verse 16 takes us to the moment when probation closes and all individuals have made their final and irrevocable decision. So let's go through this passage and examine uh, the sequence of events. Let's begin with Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12. We'll dedicate a few moments to this very, very important outpouring of the sixth plague. It says there in verse 12 of chapter 16, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Now we need to interpret symbols in this passage. The river Euphrates was the river of Babylon. The Euphrates flowed through Babylon. It was its source of security because as long as the river flowed, the people inside the city had water to drink and they could grow things to eat. But if the Euphrates River should dry up, that would mean that Babylon would fall. Now, what is this river Euphrates? Is it the river over in Iraq and the Far East? Of course not. The river is a symbolic river. You say, what do you mean? Well, in order to understand this, we have to go back to Revelation chapter 17, or forward rather to Revelation chapter 17, where you have in verses 1 and 2 the description of a harlot. It says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying uh, to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now, what is the name of this great harlot that sits on many waters? Verse 4 tells us what her name is. Verses 4 and 5. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. So notice that the great harlot is seated on many waters. Now what were the many waters of the great harlot who is Babylon? Well, we know that the river of Babylon was the Euphrates River. Now is this the literal Euphrates River that the harlot is seating on? No. Because verse 15 tells us that the waters are symbolic. Babylon is symbolic. It's not a literal harlot. It's talking about an apostate system of religion. The river Euphrates is not literal. It's speaking about something far broader. Notice verse 15 of Revelation 17. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The act of the harlot sitting on them means that she governs over them. As long as they're under her control, as long as the waters of multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples flow, she is secure. However, if the waters should dry up, if the multitudes and the tongues and the peoples should withdraw their support, it would mean that the waters of Babylon dry up, and as a result, Babylon would fall. The harlot would fall. And of course, we find in Re Revelation 16, verse 12, that when the waters dry up, it prepares the way for the coming of the kings from the east. The question is, who are the kings from the east? Well, You'll notice Matthew 24, verse 27, that tells us that when Jesus returns, He will return from the east. So the kings from the east 
are Jesus and the heavenly hosts. You say, how do we know that? Well, other than Matthew 24, verse 27, telling us that Jesus will return to this earth from the east, we find also that uh, Jesus will return with all of his angels as King of kings and Lord and Lord of lords, riding a white horse, and the armies of heaven will be following him. This is Revelation chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. So during the sixth plague, the battle of Armageddon does not take place. The battle of Armageddon is under the seventh plague. The sixth plague is the preparation for the battle of Armageddon and the drying up of the waters or the multitudes taking away their support from the harlot. This prepares the way for the coming of Jesus with the heavenly host to this earth to deliver his people from a death decree that has been given against them. So once again, we return to the question that we asked before. Why uh, do verses 14, 15, uh, 13, 14, and 15 describe the gathering of the wicked and the gathering of the righteous? Is the gathering of the wicked and the gathering of the righteous something that happens during the sixth plague, which is described in Revelation 16, verse 12? Of course not. The gathering takes place before probation closes. The righteous are clothed with the righteousness of Christ before probation closes. The wicked are all gathered by Satan before probation closes. So this means that verses uh, 13, 14, and 15 are parenthetical. In other words, they break the flow of thought. And you say, well, uh, is that unusual in the book of Revelation? The answer is no. In Revelation, it is very common to find that there are comments that are inserted uh, parenthetically that break the flow of thought. Let me just give you references so you, you can look them up. Revelation 10, verse 7. Revelation 11, verse 18. Revelation 11, verse 19. Revelation 14, 6 through 12. Revelation 15, verse 1. Revelation 16, 15, which is what we're studying now. Revelation 18, 1 through 4. All are parenthetical statements that break the flow of thought of what comes before and what comes after. Let me just give you one example of a parenthetical statement in the book of Revelation. Very common in the book of Revelation. Go with me, if you have your Bibles, to Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to read verses 4 through 6. Revelation chapter 20 and verses 4 through 6. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. These are the righteous that were martyred. They sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived... In other words, they were martyred, but now they resurrect, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So is this clear? You have a group that was martyred. They did not worship the beast or his image. They resurrect, and they perform a work of judgment, and they reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then let's continue with verse 5. Here's where we have a problem. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, wait a minute. Uh, we believe that the first resurrection is a resurrection when Jesus comes to take the faithful to heaven. But if you read verse 5 by itself, you find that it seems to say that the first resurrection is a resurrection of the rest of the dead after the thousand years. And then notice verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. So, you know, there, it seems to be totally confused here. The confusion disappears. When we realize that the first part of verse 5 is a parenthetical statement. In other words, it breaks the flow of thought. John has been talking about those who resurrect when Jesus comes, right as the millennium is about to begin. But then he's wondering, what about the rest of the dead? Those that don't resurrect when Jesus comes, what's going to happen with them? Well, 
Let's read now Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 through verse 6, and let's skip the part in verse 5 where it says, the, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. That should be in parentheses. In fact, many versions of the Bible include parentheses around this part of verse 5. So let's skip this part of verse 5 and read verse uh, 4 through verse 6. It reads like this, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. We skip that part that I said should go in parentheses. Then it says in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. This is one example of the interruption of the flow of thought with what comes before and what comes after. If we fail to see where these parenthetical statements are, we are going to run into all sorts of issues in our interpretation of the book of Revelation. Now, what I want to do in the next few moments is to present the events of Revelation 16, 12 through 16 as they appear in the text. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put these events in their chronological order. So let's go first to the textual order that we find in Revelation 16 verses 12 through 16. First of all, we have the climax, the outpouring of the sixth plague after the close of probation. So verse 12 is describing the sixth plague after the close of probation. Then verses 13 through 14 goes back to probationary time, and it describes how three evil angels will gather the kings of the earth and of the whole world to be on Satan's side for the moment when the sixth plague falls, and this happens during probationary time. In other words, verses 13 and 14 are occurring before the outpouring of the uh, sixth plague. They are occurring during the period of probation when Satan is gathering the wicked on his side. And then verse 15 is a parenthetical statement that warns God's people not to gather on Satan's side, but to be covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness so that when the sixth plague is poured out, they are on the right side of the issue. And then when you get to verse 16, it takes you to the time when probation closes, when all of the wicked have gathered together and probation closes and all of the righteous are on God's side. So let's take these events now in chronological order. I'm going to reorder the verses as they appear in Revelation 16 verses 12 through 16. And I'm going to put them in chronological order because, you know, the order that we just looked at is you have the outpouring of the sixth plague, then it takes you before probation to the gathering of the wicked by Satan and Jesus warning the righteous, make sure you're covered with the righteousness of Christ at the moment of the sixth plague. And then verse 12 takes you to the moment when everybody has been gathered on Satan's side or on Christ's side. But now let's put all of this in chronological order. If we put Revelation 16, 12 through 16 in chronological order, verses 13 and 14 would come first. Because verses 13 and 14 describe three evil angels gathering the kings of the whole world for the battle against God. And then in verse 15, Jesus warns the righteous, make sure you don't gather on Satan's side during probationary time. And then in verse 16, you have the wicked are gathered when probation closes. And then in verse 12, you have the outpouring of the sixth plague after probation's close. So in synthesis, you have the gathering of the wicked, 
in verses 13 and 14 before probation closes. Then you have the warning of Jesus to the righteous to be covered with the righteousness of Christ and not gather on Satan's side. Then you have the moment when the wicked are gathered. That's when probation closes. And then you have the outpouring of the sixth plague. So Revelation speaks of two gatherings. The first gathering is the gathering of the righteous, and the second gathering is the gathering of the wicked. And they are happening simultaneously. They're happening at the same time. During this probationary time, people are making decisions to be on Christ's side and to have His garment of righteousness, or to be on Satan's side and be naked, to use the biblical terminology. Let's talk about these two gatherings. They contrast one another. The righteous are gathered by three holy angels described in Revelation chapter 14. Satan also has three evil angels. They're they're spoken of as three evil spirits, and they gather the wicked on Satan's side. The righteous follow the lamb wherever he goes. The wicked follow the beast. The righteous worship God, the wicked worship the beast. The righteous are gathered in spiritual Jerusalem, whereas the wicked are gathered in spiritual Babylon, the enemy enemy of Jerusalem. The righteous receive the seal of God, the wicked receive the mark of the beast. The righteous are fully clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness, whereas the wicked are naked at the moment of the sixth plague. So let's read once again verses 13 and 14 to determine uh, what is being spoken of during this gathering time. Once again, verse 13 says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. The unclean spirits are spirits of demons. It says so in this very passage. In other words, they are three evil or wicked angels that Satan uses to spread his message to deceive the world. So it says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. In other words, there are three enemies of God's people, dragon, beast, and false prophet. What do these three represent? Well, the dragon represents primarily Satan. But in this case, it deals more with the rulers of the world that Satan uses to accomplish his purposes. You see, in a primary sense, the dragon symbolizes Satan. But in a secondary sense, it represents the civil rulers of the world that Satan influences to carry forward his agenda. Let me give you an example. You remember that when Jesus was born, Matthew chapter 2 verse 16 tells us that Herod had all of the male children slain two years and under because he wanted to kill the one that he thought might take his throne. But the book of Revelation tells us that it was the dragon Satan who wanted the death of the child. So Satan is the dragon, whereas Herod, a ruler of Rome, is a dragon, because he is used by Satan to accomplish Satan's purposes. And so it says, I saw three unclean spirits, three wicked angels, like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that is the kings of the earth, out of the mouth of the beast, this is the beast that rises from the sea in Revelation chapter 13, It represents the Roman Catholic papacy. It's the same thing as the little horn, the same thing as the man of sin, the same thing as the king of the north, the same thing as the Antichrist, the same thing as the abomination of desolation. These are all uh, synonymous names of the papal power. And then we find it says, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. The false prophet is the beast that arose from the earth that had two horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. And this beast represents the United States of America, primarily apostate Protestantism in the United States of America that will help heal the wound that the beast from the sea received, and it will 
uh, join in persecuting God's faithful people. So the false prophet represents apostate Protestantism trying to influence the civil powers to carry out the agenda of the beast or of the harlot or the other names that we mentioned as well. So these un three unclean spirits, these three wicked angels, they work through the dragon, through the beast, and through the false prophet for what purpose? Notice verse 14, for they are spirits of demons. See, we know now what the evil spirits are like. They are the spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. In other words, the purpose of these three evil angels influencing these three evil powers is to gather the wicked on Satan's side for the famous battle of Armageddon, the battle of the great day of God Almighty. This gathering, once again, does not take place at the moment of the sixth plague. At the sixth plague, the wicked are gathered, and the righteous are gathered, and the wicked will want to destroy the righteous. And let me explain something here. When it speaks about this battle, it's not that when Jesus is coming on the clouds in Revelation chapter 19, you know, the, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are shooting nuclear weapons at Christ. No. The battle is of these three powers against God's people. They're persecuting Christ in the person of His people. You know, uh, it reminds me of uh, the story of Saul of Tarsus. He was on the way to Damascus to persecute Christians, to bind them and to bring them back to Jerusalem before the Sanhedrin. And as he's nearing Damascus, uh, suddenly he's thrown to the ground, he sees this bright light, and he hears a voice that says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, Saul wasn't persecuting Jesus personally. Jesus was in heaven at this point. So how do we make sense out of this? In persecuting the followers of Jesus, uh, they were Saul of Tarsus was persecuting Jesus. So it is at the end of time. You know, it's not that when Jesus is coming on the clouds, the wicked are shooting nuclear weapons at Christ. No. It has to do with the wicked gathered together to try and destroy God's people. And God in the sixth plague is going to dry up the waters. He's going to dry up the multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. They will withdraw their support from this threefold system that is spoken of here. And then Jesus will come on the clouds of heaven with his heavenly armies to rescue his people and to take them to heaven. Ellen White made it clear that the gathering takes place during probationary time. So she understood that verses 13, 14, and 15 apply to events before probation closes, long before the sixth plague is poured out. Let me read you a couple of statements from the writings of Ellen White. The first is in the Seventh Avenue's Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 983. This is how it reads. The present, she's speaking of her present, the present is a solemn, fearful time for the church. The angels are already girded, awaiting the mandate of God to pour their vials of wrath upon the world. That's the seven last plagues. Destroying angels are taking up the work of vengeance, for the Spirit of God is gradually withdrawing from the world. And now listen. Satan is also mustering his forces of evil. <laughs> so notice, God's angels are gathering the righteous, but Satan is also mustering his forces of evil. And then she quotes Revelation 16 and verse 14. Going forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them under his banner to be trained for the battle of that great day of God Almighty. In another statement in the book, Counsels to Teachers, page 47, Ellen White wrote about how Satan is attempting to gather the youth on his side. This is how it reads. The future of society will be determined 
by the youth of today. Satan is making earnest, persevering efforts to corrupt the mind and debase the character of every youth. Why do we have so many problems among the youth today? Why do the youth come to the church and they hear a sermon and they say, boring? Well, the, the reason is that television and social media and texting have accustomed them to this exciting stuff and they consider the study of the Bible boring. Satan is trying to win over an entire generation of youth for the final battle. She continues writing, and she's now telling what we should be doing, those who are more up in years. Uh, and shall we who have more experience stand as mere spectators and see him, that is Satan, accomplish his purpose without hindrance? Let us stand at our post as minutemen to work for these youth and through the help of God to hold them back from the pit of destruction. And then she talks about the parable of the wheat and the tares. In the parable, while men slept, the enemy sowed tares. And while you, speaking about us, those who are more experienced, and while you, my brethren and sisters, are unconscious of Satan's work, he is gathering an army of youth under his banner, and he exults, for through them he carries on his warfare against God. Wow, what a tremendous statement. We have a tremendous work to do with our youth in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now let's go back to Revelation 16, 15, just for a few moments. And let me say that this is only the opening presentation of a series of several that I'm going to give on Revelation 16 and verse 15. You say several sermons on this one verse? Absolutely. Notice Revelation 16, verse 15 again. We're going to unpack every concept that we find in this verse in future presentations. Jesus speaks and he says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. What does that mean that Jesus is coming as a thief? Is that talking about the second coming of Jesus on the clouds of heaven? We're going to deal with that. Blessed is he who watches. What does it mean to watch? What did Jesus mean when he said to his disciples in the garden, watch? And then it says, and keeps his garments. What does it mean to keep your garments? We're going to dedicate a long period of time to the issue of the garments representing the righteousness of Christ, not only the imputed righteousness, but the imparted righteousness of Christ. And then it says, lest he walk naked. What does that mean to walk naked? And they see his shame. Now, it's interesting that when we read verse 14, and we skip verse 15, and we conclude with verse 16, in other words, we link verse 14 with verse 16, we see that verse 15 is a parenthetical statement where Jesus is saying, make sure you're covered with my righteousness in probationary time, because if you're not, you're going to be on Satan's side, and the sixth plague is going to afflict you. Notice what we find in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 14, and we'll connect it with verse 16. Speaking about the gathering of the wicked, for they, the three counterfeit angels, are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So the evil spirits go out to gather the kings of the world for the final battle. And now let's skip verse 15 and go to verse 16. And they, that is the three wicked angels, they gathered them, the kings of the earth, together in a place called, in Hebrew, Armageddon. So you'll notice clearly that verses 13, 14, and 15 are parenthetical. They describe something that happens in probationary time, verse 12, where it speaks about the outpouring of the sixth plague, and verse 16, when the wicked are finally gathered for the final battle, are sequential. Now, Let's deal with one further point before we bring this to an end. 
Once again, Revelation 16, verse 15, speaks about keeping garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. This echoes Genesis chapter 3. So let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Actually, we'll go to Genesis chapter 2 uh, first, and then we'll go to Genesis chapter 3 after that. Genesis chapter 2 speaks about Adam and Eve right after they had been created. It says in verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now Ellen White clarifies that they were naked with regards to human garments, but they were covered with a glorious soft light. In other words, they weren't totally naked, they were covered with the glory of God. They were covered with a garment of light, which represents the righteousness of Christ. They were perfectly righteous, and therefore their righteousness was exhibited by the soft light that enshrouded them. So we have here, they were both naked and they were not ashamed. Two key words in Revelation 16 and verse 15. But then Adam and Eve sinned. What happened when they sinned? Notice Genesis chapter 3, and we'll begin worth reading at verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Notice now they're hiding. Why are they hiding? Because they're naked. They're afraid of God. Let's continue reading. Verse 9, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. The robe of light had forsaken Adam and Eve. And now being naked, they're afraid of God. And they try to hide their nakedness with fig leaves. But even after that, they still feel naked. Because at this point, they have already covered themselves with fig leaves, according to verse 7. So covering themselves with fig leaves did not cover their nakedness. So how does God solve the problem of their nakedness? They're naked even with the fig leaves. They were naked shortly after they sinned. So how does God solve the problem? Notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21. This is beautiful. It says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Notice that they covered themselves with fig leaves, still felt naked, but God takes skins of animals, which undoubtedly must have been killed, as sacrifices representing the sacrifice of Christ, God takes the tunics of skin, He actually makes them, and God takes it upon Himself to clothe them. And now, the shame of their nakedness is covered because they're covered with the garments of the Lamb that was slain. What a beautiful lesson God is giving us. Now, notice the contrast to this. In Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 6, we're going to see the opposite side of the coin. Revelation chapter 6 and verses 14 through 17, which describe the second coming. Notice the reaction of the wicked. The righteous are going to say, according to Isaiah, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. But notice the reaction of the wicked. They're going to do what Adam and Eve did in the garden before they were covered with the righteousness of Christ. At the point of the sixth plague, there is no changing sides. God cannot take the garments of Christ to cover the wicked at that point. Notice Revelation 6, verse 14. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. Why are they hiding? Because, folks, they're naked. They're not covered with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So the righteous are not going to be hiding. The wicked are going to be hiding because they're naked and they are ashamed. 
Why do they want to be hidden? Notice verse 16, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. They don't want to see the face of Jesus, because they're ashamed. They're naked, in other words. And then we find in verse 17 the question, For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Well, the answer to this question is in the very next chapter, the sealing of the 144,000. The last generation that will go through the time of trouble will not be ashamed. They will not be naked. They will receive Jesus with open arms because they are covered with the robe of His perfect righteousness. What a beautiful story is portrayed here in the book of Revelation. But this cannot only be academic. We must appropriate the message that we have shared this morning. We must be certain that we are covered with the robe of Christ's imputed righteousness and that we are covered with the robe of His imparted righteousness. The first is our title to heaven, and the second is our fitness for heaven. Jesus will not take to heaven anyone who does not have the title or the fitness. May we have this experience, I pray to the Lord as we conclude this morning. Do you know that there's power in the name of Jesus? Let's sing number 229, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we've studied a very awesome subject. It has to do with our eternal salvation. And so we ask, as we end this worship service, that you will empower us to live for you and also to proclaim this wonderful message to the world. We know that our only hope in the end time is to be covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness 
We plead that you will do that even now. And then that you will cover us not only with your justification, but also with the beautiful robe of the character of Christ. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.